do what work you can now, but don't let yourself get intimidated by uh, by big ideas, by ideas that are gonna take a long time that you don't know exactly how you're gonna get there. Um, latch onto those and, and keep them, keep, keep coming back to them and don't let them just go away because uh, it would take a long time or it's, you don't even, maybe you don't have some of the skills necessary to, to carry it out. Maybe you'll find other people who have that. So, you know, hold onto those ideas, talk about them with people, um, bounce ideas off other people and let them help the idea evolve and, and come into fruition. Um, that's, I think that would be the, the, the best advice or the thing that's served me the most in my artistic practices. And, you know, in several um, instances has led to employment as well and to, um, you know, make, do, making a, a, a living um, or at least helping to meet, make the ends meet. And a lot of that is just, um, yeah, leaning into the things that I find really interesting and, and drive me and not letting the fear that they might not work out. I might work on it for seven years and then oh, it might not come to fruition. That's fine because along those seven years that has spawned, that, that investment in that interest and the thing that really drives me has spawned so many offshoots and so many connections to other people uh, and might lead somewhere I didn't have any idea it was leading. You know, when I first had a little synthesizer and I pushed the button and I was like, that sounds kind of funny and buzzy. And then I hooked it to a big speaker and it was just, I was like, whoa, what is that sound? I had no idea at that point that knowing like, this is so interesting to me. I need to follow this thread. I had no idea that that was going to lead to me building giant domes full of, you know, at some point 24 speakers and vibrating floors. Um, but really when I look back, that's, that is an inflection point where it's something that interested me so much that I just started going down that rabbit hole. Don't be afraid to go down the rabbit hole, kids. <laughs> My name is Jake Metz, and I'm a creative multimedia technologist. I went to a pretty uh, small high school. My graduating class was 200 people or so. Uh, so we really didn't have many, um, a, a very extensive uh, breadth of art and technology and multimedia and expression courses. Um, so through my high school years, I was in um, the Madrigals, acapella choir, and musicals. And uh, that was really cool. That, that taught me how to work in an ensemble, which was different than just playing guitar by yourself or even in a band. Uh, and it, it also taught me a lot about um, kind of uh, discipline and, and the importance of regular practice because we, you know, it was f three or four days a week. Um, that we would rehearse for you know two, uh, hour and a half, two hours uh, a day when we did that, um, and then beyond that in high school uh, we had some programming courses. So that started leading me into how you could use computers to control um, things. In this case, sound and images. We, my friends and I, would make little video games, and then we would make these weird kind of surrealist websites <coughs> for. Uh, I don't know, some, whatever nonsense we were, we were on at that time. I was in a band with some friends and we got into, um, probably when I was 17, I started recording music. Now I had been playing with the sound recorder app on Windows since I was a little kid. You know, you'd, you'd take a sound and you'd slow it down and you'd turn it around backwards and it sounded weird. And then you could find all the Windows sounds in a folder on the computer and you could start chopping those up. Um, but around the time I was maybe six, 15, 16, 17, I started um, playing around with something called Fruity Loops, um, which is a music production software. It's now called FL Studio. Um, at some point they got more professional. They were like, can't be Fruity Loops anymore. We're FL Studio. And then I started recording 
live instrumentation for uh, a band that I was in. We wanted to record our old, own album, so we recorded a CD and, and then uh, gave it out to all the, the people in our class. And it was uh, it was uh, a cr somewhat crude teenage music in the vein of Tenacious D that uh, I probably will not share. <laughs> Through my college years, I continued to just play music. Uh, I, I took a bit of a step back because I was doing an engineering degree here. Um, I will say that when I had the chance to study abroad when I was an undergrad uh, and got to go across Western Europe and see lots of museums and see street performers and see plays and operas, and um, that really was, was huge for me. I was 19, you know, and so I had grown up in this small town come here to U of I where a bunch of the people I went to school with also were, um, and if not, a bunch of the similar type people in the suburbs, uh, from the suburbs. So going abroad when I was 19 really opened my eyes to the wider world and wider avenues of culture and cultural expression. Um, but beyond that, I was kind of focused on engineering and honestly partying <laughs> and uh, I always played guitar and I was in some bands through college. Uh, and then right towards the end of college, I started expanding into more extensive recording activities. Uh, and I was also starting to book shows with some folks. And that's actually how I met some other people in town. When I graduated college, I had a bit of a crisis because I didn't know what I was going to do. The financial crisis had happened. I was feeling pretty turned off of going and working as an engineer in industry. Um, I often blame Kurt Vonnegut because I was reading a lot of Kurt Vonnegut and he's pretty, uh, he has a pretty strong critique of uh, engineers and the way we, uh, we uh, technology our society. Um, so I decided to keep living in Urbana. My brothers, uh, my, one of my brothers had a house here with some friends. My other brother was coming here the next year. I thought it might be cool to hang out in town and spend time with them. At that point, I was just working a part-time job and we had this house and I started, uh, I decided that, well, I, I guess I can do whatever I want now. I'm, I'm an adult. Um, so I built a recording studio in that basement with kind of a two room, live room, control room thing. Uh, and then me and another guy, Jack Maples, who went on to be one of my biggest creative partnerships uh, through the last decade, uh, started something called Urbana Basement. And that was a project where we brought in local bands to um, document the music scene. Uh, so we would do multi-track kind of professional audio recording and multi-camera video and cut it all together and put it up online. Um, that was a, a great project. I learned a lot. And that, that project actually built a portfolio for me, which uh, landed me in my current job that I work for the university in, uh, which is the Media Commons Multimedia Technologist. I think my interest in multi-sensory art, um, well, not, I, I don't know that it's, that it's uh, specifically driven by a desire to make this more accessible to people with different sensory uh, ability, um, but it's, it's certainly a nice side effect that I have thought about. Um, I think for me, I, I pursue this because that's the way we experience the world, right? I don't, I don't go, out in nature and I hear the wind and the trees aren't blowing too, right? And I'm not feeling it against my skin. Uh, the way we experience the world is multi-sensory. But certainly, uh, yeah, the idea about using this technology to allow people to perceive it through different senses is one that I that I think about. And uh, part of the goal with the, uh, I don't know, version, what will be eventually version three of these multimedia domes uh, would be to do something where, and at least in my own ideas for what my artistic expression using these systems is working towards, is to have uh, audio-visual performance um, that's tied together. Uh, and that would be building something where as the sound moves around you, you project light um, that, that is connected to that sound. Uh, around uh, this sphere so people can experience that. Uh, and yes, yeah, similarly with um, the bass transduction floors, um, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting application of using that 
um, to enhance the experience that a deaf or partially deaf person might have in these immersive multimedia environments where then you're feeling the impact of these sounds and you're kind of seeing light dance around you in an immersive context. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard for me to say. I don't know how that, you know, the idea of, of trying to understand the uh, subjective perception of another human is, I don't know, it's hard to wrap one's mind around. But if I provide a really rich palette, <laughs> there's something for everyone there, I think. Um, and again, I mean, I guess the goal is to open up systems that have these multi-sensory capabilities so that other artists can come in and do, you know, do what they will with them. You know, I don't want this uh, to be locked down to any one medium. I'm trying to make a really flexible system that artists in multiple mediums can can collaborate or uh, or work in multiple mediums. I think I think the the future is definitely multidisciplinary. That's something that I think both in academia and in artistic practices. For those of you out there, artists in CU, I really, and I don't know where it would happen yet, but I find myself wishing we had a larger creative arts center. Um, a place with a bunch of practice space for bands, a place with studio bays for uh, physical artists, a place where I could put this immersive multimedia laboratory and bring people in and teach workshops and give people space to explore those realms. Uh, a place where there could be a big empty floor that could be multi-use and used for dance performances or different sorts of theater or pop-up gallery shows. I think this is something that our town I think there, there are enough people here who want and would support that. Um, the difficult part is <laughs> creating the organization and structure to get a bunch of people to work together on that. Um, so that's something I'd really like to work on um, and I've been kind of working on for the past year. I've been talking to a lot of people about this and gathering interest and scoping out some physical spaces and thinking about what it would look like and observing other places like this that are happening around the country uh, and around the world. Uh, you know, this is not a particularly unique idea, um, but it's one that doesn't fully exist here. There are some little pockets of this sort of thing, but I think having, having a place that would be for uh, creative expression uh, and, and give people a chance to work on their artistry next door to people doing things in a different medium. Um, a place where you could cross-pollinate between different artists, and that's because that's one of my favorite things, is to work with someone in a different medium and collaborate. Again, that's, that's what I thrive on. I, I do work by myself. Uh, I don't particularly like it. <laughs> it takes me a long time to do creative work when I'm by myself. I get distracted, I'm following all these different, it's hard for me to prioritize amidst all the different interests. But when I find someone else who is as committed to a project or an idea or their art form as I am to mine, and we find that we have crossover and overlap, that is one of the most magical um, aspects of, of human connection that I've experienced. <laughs>